Good morning, folks. Can you hear me now? Is everybody ready? Okay, great. It's going to be an awesome service. All right, folks. First of all, I'd like to just uh, do a welcome and an introduction to Mr. Jonathan Case, our guest preacher. Uh, Jonathan is professor, professor of theology at Houghton University. Uh, previously, he served as lecturer in theological studies at Kingsley College. That's Melbourne, Australia. Very interesting. And as a pastor in Western Oklahoma. So folks, we do have some announcements and some celebrations. Uh, the remnants of the church library have been moved to the robing room here in the church building. Feel free to take books and return them as you are able. If you wish to send a card to Mary McCarthage, her home address is printed in this Sunday's bulletin. Uh, please help the Board of Elders plan our worship services during this time of transition by completing a brief evaluation form each week. Printed forms are available every Sunday in the bulletin. Place completed forms in the offering baskets at the back of the sanctuary. Or you can complete a worship evaluation online anytime. The link is listed in this Sunday's bulletin. <coughs> Our guest preacher next week will be Wendy Fembro. Uh, this is a call to worship here, folks. Uh, if you want to follow along in your bulletin, uh, good friends, rejoice. God is with us. <laughs>
some celebrations here, but sharing our concerns. Uh, does anybody have any concerns? My mic is not loud enough. Closer, yeah. Closer, okay. Can everybody hear me now? All right, sorry about that. Okay, so sharing our concerns. Do we have any concerns or anything like that that we'd like to share? I do have some announcements that we can go over as well, but uh, does anybody have any concerns right now? Any prayer concerns? No? Nobody? Okay. I guess we'll do the pastoral prayer, which is you. Oh God, we, we pause in your presence this morning to give you thanks for you are a good God. And we're grateful that through our Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, you have called us to yourself in your church. And so we thank you that we can call you Father this morning and have confidence to come before you. As I don't know this congregation, Lord, um, I can only pray that, that you will intercede on behalf of those who are struggling with questions, with doubts, with illnesses, with problems that appear to be insurmountable um, in people's lives. And I pray that through the inspiration and moving of your spirit, you would help people in this congregation to support each other, both in word and gesture, um, find ways to really be the body of Christ to each other. And in ways that we cannot entirely figure out in your own mysterious way, uh, will you help people who are struggling this morning to find the answers and the help that they are seeking? As we look around our world uh, today, we hardly know where to start to pray. Uh, so many things weigh upon us and, and press upon us. Uh, the way that your creation is being just systematically destroyed at, at an alarming rate. Uh, conflict in so many parts of our world. Uh, entire communities that are at risk on uh, account of decisions that people in authority make that benefit only them or certain members of, of their constituency. Help us, Lord, um, to be that people who, who speak up. Help us not to be complicit on account of our silence. Um, help us to remember that you call us both to do justice and to love mercy. Um, we think this morning especially about the ongoing conflict in Eastern Europe. Um, how can there be an end to this? Lord, would you move upon your people uh, who have the ear of those who are making decisions uh, to let calmer heads and cooler heads prevail, that lives would not be lost and that somehow there could be uh, an end to this conflict and, and people who are hurting, who have been displaced, uh, would find the, the healing and the reconciliation that they need. Um, there, are so many, um, there are so many unspoken and, and unknown needs in this congregation. Um, we can only offer them up to you and um, Lord, let us take a let us take a moment here for people to offer their prayers silently to you. Yeah. And now let us recite the prayer that our Lord taught us, our Father, who art in heaven.
now have a responsive reading. This is Psalm 96, verses 1 through 6 and 11 and 12. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among nations. His marvelous deeds among people. Praise the Lord, and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared of all of us. For all the gods of the nation are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Slender and majesty of the Lord, strength and glory of the Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it.
Bless our gifts to you, God, and we thank you for blessing us and for using these gifts to further your kingdom. Amen. Things could get worse. 
I couldn't imagine how much worse our civil discourse would be in the last four years. COVID, the January 6th riots, Black Lives Matter protests, uh, abortion rights, catastrophic climate change, the kind of cultural pressure cooker that we seem to be in has seeped down into just our everyday encounter and conversations with people. So lots of folks have suggested on account of the frustration that people are feeling really about everything these days, that the dominant characteristic of our age is rage. So the irate airline passenger, you know, just punching the poor cabin steward, or the talk show host frothing at the mouth about the latest conspiracy theory, uh, or the stereotypical Karen, are you familiar with this term from social media, the Karen who is just stomping her feet because she can't get her way and demanding to speak to the manager. These are the defining images of the age of rage. Now I actually think it's too bad that the name Karen has been used to describe the stereotype because I know lots of Karens and they're really all lovely people. Um, so I'm going to propose a different name for that stereotype. I'm going to choose the name Alex. And if your name is Alex this morning, this isn't your lucky day. Um, our text this morning is from one of Paul's later letters, and it bears all the marks of a mature mind. Now, chapter 4, he's beginning to wrap things up. And as he wraps this letter up, he turns to a dispute uh, between two women in the church, Euodia uh, and Syntyche, and he asks an unnamed friend of his to get involved in this argument. This would not be an enviable task. If someone said to me, Case, you need to get stuck into this argument these two women are having, I'd be like, hey, I have enough drama in my life, okay? I'm not going to do that. Um, and biblical scholars have speculated wildly on what this argument might have been about, but there's just not enough in the text to really tell us. But whatever it, whatever it was, it must have been important enough for him to actually name names in a public letter. Now, if you look at the overall flow of this passage in your Bible, it does make sense to do what Paul is doing. He goes from talking about working through a disagreement in the church to a more general encouragement to rejoice in the Lord, to finally let our gentleness be known to everyone. Because if, if rejoicing in the Lord, if being grateful for what God has done for us, if that really becomes a secondary concern, then our disagreements will be the primary thing that we are known for. And God knows there are lots of disagreements in the church these days. Um, I mean, if you want a real eye-opening experience, talk to someone with no connection to Christianity or the church at all, and ask them what they think about Christians today. That most people are not going to say, oh yeah, those Christians, those people who can disagree so graciously with someone. That's not the image, that's not the vibe that we're giving off in this culture. Um, but Paul's train of thought seems to go something like, our rejoicing in the Lord should make a difference in the way that we handle disagreement. So our gentleness will be evident to everyone. It should be obvious to everyone. And if you're wondering, the word gentleness here in the New Testament just means something like being moderate in your spirit, not just lashing out in anger and reacting. Um, in the New Testament, gentleness is listed as one of the fruits of the spirit, along with love and joy and peace and patience and so on. These characteristics 
are what the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, referred to as our tempers. Now that is an archaic word. And what it means is something like our basic disposition, how we, how we respond to people. So how is it possible for our gentleness to be evident to all, to be obvious to everyone in this age in which we're living? What vibe are we giving off to people? So my students sometimes say to me, um, Prof, you always look so stern, like you're angry about something. I, I, I have to tell them, look, this is just the bone structure God gave me, okay? I'm not, I'm, I don't consider myself an angry person. Socially awkward, yeah. <laughs> Absent-minded, oh yeah, right. But not angry. That is most of the time. Because I suspect, like probably many of you, I do have, I do have those areas that just put me on the boil. And the problem in the age of rage is that that most of the time is getting gradually sort of thinned out. So it's easier to just redline now over issues. And if you don't believe that, let me welcome you to social media, where gentleness goes to die the death of a thousand caps locks. Journalist Oliver Berkman recently wrote, we've built a world that's extremely good at generating causes for anger, but extremely bad at giving us, at giving us anything constructive to do with it. The twisted genius of social media, he says, is that it seems to provide something constructive to do by engaging with posts when really all that does is just spread the anger further. Despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in a Facebook thread. We have to come to terms with the uncomfortable fact that anger is never presented in a good light in the Bible, and we're repeatedly warned against letting it get the upper hand. Um, in the New Testament, there are basically two words that are used to translate anger. Uh, one is a word that means kind of the steady, sort of teeth-grinding irritation you have in something. Maybe you, you're wandering around the house or grumbling about something. Um, the other is when you're lashing out, it's the old baseball manager to the umpire kind of treatment. And these two ideas are closely related because the former often morphs into the latter. But neither is compatible with the fruit of the Spirit. Both are condemned by the Apostle Paul as what he calls works of the flesh. That is evidence in our lives of where the Spirit is not in control. So we're told both in Ephesians and Colossians to put away all anger and wrath. Um, and that word all, put away all anger and wrath, is a very nuanced Greek word. Do you know what it means? It means all. Yeah, it just means all. And I think we need to be super careful, especially in an age of rage, of finding ways to justify our anger, because if there's one thing that we're all good at, is self-deception. And we find a way to justify our anger. Uh, I love it when people try to quote the Bible at me. Right? What about Jesus? He got angry? Yes, he got angry at religious professionals that put religious minutia ahead of people. That's why Jesus got angry. Right? Or I get this one. My Bible says in Ephesians, be angry and sin not. Yes, and the passage immediately after says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, deal with it before it develops into something harmful and damaging. Or my personal favorite that I hear a lot, and probably so do you, you're just talking about being nice, Case okay? so The gospel is offensive, you know. 
It's more than just being nice. Friends, let me tell you, when you, when you hear someone say, the gospel is offensive, here's what the offense of the gospel means to the apostle. The Christ of God has been crucified by sinful people. That's the offense of the gospel. The offense of the gospel is not a license for us to go out and offend people in Jesus' name. I mean, that's not the way it works. And by the way, out of, out of long personal experience, I can tell you, you don't want to be part of a church where it's made up primarily of people whose main business in life is offending other people in Jesus' name. That's not a church that anyone wants to be a part of. Probably the most substantive objection to what I'm saying about anger is this. Um, some folks will say, not being angry is a luxury that only those people who are not in danger can afford. Only those people who are not on the business end of a gun. Only those people who are members of a community that is not being disadvantaged or marginalized. In other words, in other words someone could say to me, look, Case, if you are the one on the margins, if you were the one that had crosshairs on your back, you'd feel a little bit different about anger. And in some ways, that's probably true. And I'm sure that when someone's life is in imminent danger or entire communities are at risk, people can't help but feel angry. But in this case, and I wish I had more time to develop this, it's critical to take that understandable anger and channel it in genuinely productive directions. What the late great author Terry Pratchett once called militant decency. Militant decency. The point I'm trying to make, the overarching point, is that anger, wrath, should not be a dominant disposition in our lives. It often leads to violence and to payback. And Christians are never called to this. So what are we supposed to do when there's so much rage around us? The Christian tradition has had a lot to say about reorienting our basic dispositions. The way this happens is through what Christians have called sanctification where God can cleanse us and reorient the way that we actually live. In this way, sanctifying us or setting us apart for the way that God wants us to live. Now let me tell you about my own religious upbringing. I came out of the revivalist tradition. Um, any of you ever been to an old-fashioned revival where the preacher would have an altar call? Oh, they were wild. They were wild. After the sermon, you were invited to come up to the altar and kneel down and lay your all on the altar, we call it. And in this act of consecration, the Spirit would then sanctify you and cleanse you and set you apart for service. So you came down to the altar and you maybe you knelt as an Alex. But then the Spirit did his work and you got up and Rose went forth as a Dolly Parton. Right. This is the way it was supposed to work. This is the belief that set apart the so-called revivalist holiness denominations from all the other churches. This was our distinctive. I mean, Catholics had papal infallibility. Baptists had inerrancy. Charismatics had speak in tongues. Calvinists had predestination. I mean, they had no choice in the matter. But we had sanctification, and if we lost that, well, we would be just like any other vanilla evangelical Protestant denomination. The problem was that kind of thinking, that experience was quickly lost. 
And Monday morning rolled around, and guess what? Anger and rage were still a problem. You were back to being an Alex until the next altar call. I think most churches today across the board realize that any kind of silver bullet solution to rage is not going to work. It's not the way it works for most people. Even if we can emphasize that God does desire us to be set apart for God's purposes and, and wants to reorient our dispositions. But for most people, this process takes a great deal of time and it, it involves us being honest before God and being honest with one another. The crucial missing circuit in all of this was always the role of the church. And if you don't hear anything else that I'm saying this morning, if there's one thing that we need to recover in the age of rage, it's the centrality of the church, of the body of Christ, as the school of the Holy Spirit, where we learn from each other how to cultivate that spirit of gentleness. Because here's the thing, if we're not cultivating that in here, among ourselves, among brothers and sisters in Christ, you know it is not being cultivated out there in the broader culture. And too often, too often, not only does the church not lead the culture, too often the church actually amplifies the drama going on around us. And we end up imitating you know, the political gamesmanship and the point scoring that we see in Albany or that we see in Washington, D.C. But the church in this country will destroy itself if we continue to take that route. Take care, Paul tells the Galatian church. If you bite and devour each other, take care that you don't consume each other. Some of you might be thinking right now as I wrap this up, oh, hang on, Case, being gentle won't solve the complex and divisive issues that we're facing in your body. It won't solve it. But increasing levels of rage will only make it worse. And while I'm no prophet, folks, Another election cycle is almost upon us. Oh, goody. <laughs> and every issue that is dividing us, you know this, every issue is only going to get worse. Recovering the fruit of gentleness is not a sufficient condition for solving anything. By itself, it won't do it, but it is necessary. It is necessary. We have loads more work to do, but you can't resolve any conflict apart from the use of gentleness. And you all know, you all know that voting is no way to actually solve issues and problems. I leave you all today with a heartfelt prayer that the body of Christ would become the chief bulwark against the age of rage and not an accomplice to it. That as people who follow Jesus, we practice the difficult work of mediating between Yodia and Syntyche, so that when we cross the line, and we will lose our temper, we learn to swallow our pride and apologize and encourage each other to be gentle. I ask you all this morning, in this cultural moment in which we find ourselves, what about us is evident to all. May Christ through his Holy Spirit continue to sanctify us as we seek to cultivate the fruit of gentleness in our lives together. God bless you. Thank you so much for your kind attention this morning.
did miss uh, on Mary Lou Cartledge, apparently Mary Lou Cartledge and two other people, Marion Huntington and Paula Still, are at all at Alder Elderwood. I forgot to mention that earlier, I do apologize, so keep them in your prayers, thanks. Now receive the benediction. May the God who has blessed you through Christ with the Holy Spirit enable you to produce the fruit of gentleness in your lives. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.